this week, Tuesday, I have a possible promotion up for work. So be, be, just keep keep, in, uh, keep me in prayer for that. It's field engineer two. I'll be Monday through Friday, 7 to 4, <laughs> out of the field. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. I'm, I'm extremely happy. I'm very honored to even have the opportunity. I applied for it about five months ago. Kind of thought they overlooked me by now. Um, so they emailed me last week and had the interview Tuesday morning. I'm, I'm extremely excited for this. At the least, it's a learning experience for me to learn from. So I just want to say I thank everyone for being here this morning. I just pray that we can all receive what God wants us to receive today. So, Brother Steve, you got a testimony? Uh, I just want to say how, how, how great God is. Um, I want to thank him for everything that he's done for me and my family. Um, we've been through a lot. And, um, you know, he helps us on a daily basis. And I just, I just want to always thank him for, for every step that he, he gives us. Um, I, I've been working on my neighbors a little bit, you know, trying to um, spread the word a little bit and bring in some more people to the church. And, you know, God gives us the words that we need to speak. You know, you don't realize you might say something that means something to somebody. Uh, it might be just, you know, just a few words. You know, somebody might be in that state of mind where they might be suicidal or, or going through something or, you know, what you've been through, you know, and those few words that you might say to someone might mean a tremendous amount. So don't hesitate to, you know, spread the word or just say a kind word to somebody, you know, um, open a door for someone. You know, let your light shine a little bit. So um, I've done a lot of, of bad things in my life, and God put it on my heart to make things right. So I try to do everything I can do to, to make things better. So uh, I want my light to shine, you know, until the day I die. So uh, maybe God will remember me, you know, and... and uh, Bring, bring, bring those people in to salvation because this world needs it. So y'all keep us in prayer and thank you for everything. Righty. So we're going to go ahead and turn to uh, Luke chapter 15, verse 1. If you, if you feel and are able to, just go ahead and stand in honor of the word of God. I don't know, this morning, for whatever reason, the, the, that, that, that song just sticking with me about why should I worry. I know we go through storms in this life. Our families fall apart. We, our jobs fall apart. Our finances fall apart. We might be stressing about finances, but why should I worry? Amen. Very thankful for God, thankful for the power of the Holy Ghost. I don't know why that's sticking with me. I don't know if somebody needs to really grasp that. Why should I worry this morning? It's in God's hand, whoever you are. I just want you to know whatever you're going through, it's in God's hand. You just have to give it to him 100%. I've heard of stories from some elders in churches back in the day when they couldn't pay their bills. They used to take their bills, and they would, they would pay to the tithes. They would go to church. They would give. They would bless the man of God, and they would take their power bill or their water bill or whatever they needed, and they would put it in their Bible and close it, and God would always make a way. I know God's made a way in my life many times to keep the power on. So, all right, Luke chapter 15, verse 1. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for, to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness to go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner, one sinner that repenteth. More than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. The New Testament states that God came for the broken, 
for the sick. He didn't come for the rich. He didn't come for the know-it-alls. He didn't come for the arrogance. He came for those that were broken, that know, that know they need help. Lift your, lift your hearts with your hands towards heaven. We're going to bless this message before Pastor Myers comes up. Lord, I mean, Father, we thank you and praise you for this opportunity we have to hear the word of God. God, you said, give us him have an ear. Let him hear the word of God this morning. God, let it plant a seed in our hearts. God, let the power of the blood flow through this message this morning, God. Let it unharden the hearts that are hardened, God. Let it move in the minds and the hearts of those here. God, let it plant a seed that we can bear the fruit of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So glad to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. If you're watching online, we encourage you to share the video. If you're listening through Spreaker, the audio broadcast, if you will, share it when you get a chance. So glad to see God working in, in the lives of people. As I get ready to preach the word of God to you this morning, one thing stands out in my mind, the simple fact that I would be a foolish man to just stand up here and say a few words, try to flatter you with what I felt like was the best thing to preach about or talk about and not talk to you in a way, preach to you in a way that would help you. There's a lot of preaching that goes on in our world today and has over the generations that I don't think it really did much to help anybody. I believe there comes a time in preaching whenever you have to lay aside a lot of the comedy, lay aside a lot of the foolish, empty speaking, and get right down to what's going to help somebody. And as a pastor, that's my desire. I don't want to come to church and say anything that's not going to benefit you in some way or form. But this morning, I desire that you'll pray that God will use me to say the things that are going to help somebody. You understand where I'm coming from? Yeah. Is there anybody here that says, when I hear the word of God, I'm not just wanting to hear another flowery message? Anybody? I really want God to take the word and speak to me. Well, that's what I I pray that God will do this morning. I want you to say this with me. This came to my mind as I was sitting there. Brother Stephen was reading the text for us this morning. But I want you to say this with me. Mercy is the answer. Mercy is the answer. i say that one more time. Mercy is the answer. Now, how many of you really believe that? Some of you may be on the fence and say, I don't know what you're about to preach, Brother Myers. Well, you know, when I think about mercy, it is the implacable love of God in motion. It is the forward moving of God's love. It's not a stagnant moving of love, if you will, but it is God's love in motion. In your life and in my life. I believe there's a certain element of mercy in the world Today, even in the face of so much evil and ungodliness, there's a certain level of mercy. There are people that curse God to his face. We have sinful, abominable marches and parades where people parade up and down and celebrate their abominable lifestyles in the face of God and in the public eye. But still yet, God's mercy remains. I've often thought and seen things so unbelievable in my lifetime, I wondered why God didn't strike somebody dead. You know why? It's because of his mercy. And if he does strike somebody dead, it's because he's extended mercy to the point that they refuse mercy and will not receive it. But you know, when I look at the fact that his mercy is so amazing in all of our lives and to humanity. The one thing that I have to recognize, and you do as well, is that as a beneficiary of God's mercy, you and I have to remember that we're not called to simply receive mercy. 
You and I are called to reciprocate mercy. Not just to be on the receiving end of mercy, but to also reciprocate it. Not to just take it, but to also give it. You agree with that? Say amen. You see, I read in the book of Mark, chapter number 11, verse 25. He said, and when you stand praying, forgive, if you have ought against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. Now, I want you to listen to verse number 26. I really want to take time to slow down in absolute molasses gear And I really want you to get a hold of this one verse, 26. Write it down on your brain. Hide it in the recesses of your heart. Because every time that you feel bitter, ought, aggravated, stressed, strained, mad, jealous, bitter, or any other ungodly, fleshly feeling towards anybody or any situation, here's what he said. But if you do not forgive... I'm going to take this real slow. But if you do not forgive, if I do not forgive, Brother Eric, if you do not forgive, he says, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive you your trespass. Now, we're talking about mercy this morning. How can we say that we're merciful if we're the one always with our hand out wanting God to have mercy and forgive us. But yet at the same time, we're not reciprocating the same mercy that God has shown us. I remember a a illustration that I used over the years and I've probably shared it here a handful of times and I just feel like sharing it again this morning just came back to my mind. But some of you may remember the little story that I told and if my memory's just right on how the story went, it's been a long time since I've told this, But in this particular story, there was a little boy that kept coming home late every day. Every time that it was dinner time, back in the day, you remember back in the day whenever mom called for dinner, the whole table would be set, everybody sat down at the table, and that's where you ate. You didn't bring a TV tray into the living room while you played on your phone, and somebody in another bedroom, and somebody outside, everybody came and sat at the dinner table, and there, you had certain people that set the table, and such, you remember that, certain people did the dishes, Anyway, so this little boy kept showing up to dinner late every day. And his daddy and mama had been getting on to him. And uh, finally that daddy came to him and said, Look, son, don't come in here with your elbows and your arms and your hands all filthy and you got a sweat dirt ring around your neck and looking like this right after your mom's already sat down the table. We've already said grace and you keep coming in late. This isn't going to happen again. He said, the next time that happens, you'll go without any food. So the little boy, he heard what dad said. He was forewarned. He knew what the deal was. He knew what the the consequence would be. Well, lo and behold, a day or two went by, and here come the little boy. Here he was. He was running late again, this time worse than any time before. Well, the family was already sitting there at the table. And looked, and there was his chair. Dad told him, he said, sit down, son. So the little boy sat down at the dinner table. And before that little boy was no plate. And his mama went and got a plate, set it down. Dad shook his head and said, no, he's not eating tonight. I've already told him that if he came home late again, you're not going to eat. We're not going to keep doing this. You're going to learn your lesson. You're not going to do this anymore. So there set an empty plate in front of the little boy. Well, the dad said, it's time for us to say grace. So they bowed their head. They had been waiting and waiting on this little boy, and finally they just decided to say grace. So they all bowed their heads, and while that they bowed their head to give, uh, ask God to, to bless their food and whatnot, Sister Tammy, that daddy, reached across the table and took the little boy's empty plate and put the empty plate in front of him and put the full plate in front of his son. And whenever they opened up their eyes, Sister Farmer and the little boy looked down. There sat a plate full of food, looked across the table, and his daddy had nothing in front of him. His eyes got real big as he didn't really understand what was going on. He said, son, 
He said, this is just how much I love you. Tonight I will eat nothing. You will eat something. He said, but don't let it happen again. Let me tell you something this evening and this morning. You see, the love of God is very similar in this respect. That God sent his only begotten son in the place and in the steed of you and of me. Now you might feel like a rotten scoundrel. You may feel like the worst, dirtiest, lowest dog on the earth. But I want you to understand that's the reason why that mercy, God's mercy, not just any mercy, is so beautiful. It's the reason why God's mercy is so amazing. It's the reason why that the psalmist, knowing what he had done in his life, has anybody agree with me? The psalmist David, he really messed up. He really messed up. I mean, you can't get much worse than uh, you having an affair with another man's wife and the very man that it was her husband was one of your uh, men that fought in battle as you were the captain and he fought under that in that battle the regime you you have him come home to try to make it look like that he's the one that got her pregnant and before it's over with he don't even go to her house in allegiance to the captain of the uh, of the army David he lays at the doorstep all night long and said how can i Go in and, and be with my family, my wife, tonight while my brothers are out there on the battlefield. So he slept on David's doorstep that night. So David's plan had failed. And the next morning when David got up and he realized he was there, he ended up telling them, send a, send the man out to the front lines and push him out there in the front when the battle gets hot. In other words, and then retreat back and leave him out there by himself. What he was doing, he was having the man's life Life taken from him, an innocent man. David had an innocent man's life taken because he was trying to hide his own sin. Now, does anybody agree David messed up? I said David messed up. But I want you to know that David got down on his face. David hid himself in sackcloth and ashes. He began to pray. He wouldn't eat. He fasted. And God began to show mercy unto David. How many of you know David didn't deserve the mercy of God? God could have easily done the same thing that he had done with Ananias and Sapphira and allowed David to just drop graveyard cold dead. But God showed mercy unto that man named David. Somebody said, Say amen to that. I thank God for his mercy. Can somebody say praise the Lord? But that's the kind of God that you and I serve. You see, the thing this morning is uh, that when we look at the fact that God wants us to reciprocate it, (coughs) not just receive it, but to also give it. I look at our text in respect to that very thought. And I understand this morning that there are those in this crowd in our text They can only see the pendulum of God's mercy swinging in their direction. I have a real problem with that this morning. Amen. If you think that the pendulum of God's mercy is only swinging in Pastor Myers' direction or the people that have it together most of the time... Amen. Those who were raised in church or those that cut their teeth on the back of a church pew, so to speak. I want to tell you this morning, that is not the case. I serve a God that if your child has been laid up underneath some bridge somewhere for the last two weeks with a dope needle in his arm, passed out high, jacked up on drugs, that if your child walked in here on a Sunday morning, that God would reach out to him just like he'd reach out to somebody just seeking a little bit of a touch of the hand of God. Why? Because God's mercy is that good. And when you fail to think or fail to realize uh, that the mercy and the pendulum of mercy isn't just swinging in the elite's favor. It's not just swinging in the church's favor. It's not just swinging to the church choir's favor. But that mercy swings wide. I said that mercy swings wide. It's a pendulum that covers a multitude of sins. It's a pendulum that swings so wide that those who have messed up, those who have failed, those who have fallen on their face can get themselves together. Amen. Wipe the dust off of themselves. Stand up before God. Amen. Even if their knees might be trembling. uh, Even if their feet don't walk straight uh, for a little while. Thank God 
this morning uh, that God said, I love you anyway. Come on, somebody. You came to me dirty. You came to me a mess. Uh, your life was a train wreck. But when you came to me, I loved you like nobody else would love you. You feel like in the midnight hour that you might as well just end your life. Uh, why does my life have purpose? Uh, it doesn't have a shred of purpose. Uh, I'm going down a road uh, that has no purpose, preacher. But let me tell you, hey man, all you've got to do is have a direct encounter on that road of disappointment, on that road of depression, on that road of discouragement and find the master of mercy and let God show you just how good he still is. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Somebody raise your hand and say, thank God this morning for his mercy. But the, the gospel of Luke, it records an account of which Jesus has got a mixed audience. In this crowd, there are sinners. In this crowd, there are publicans. There are Pharisees and there are scribes. While this is taking place and Jesus is ministering to the people that are there, namely those of low estate, those that others may not have anything to do with, he catches flack for it. Let me tell you this. Maybe somehow the scribes and the Pharisees had thought to themselves that he is sitting here, and he is eating, and he is conversing in the audience of people of low degree. How dare, if you're God, why would you do that? Their mentality was, if you're really the Messiah, what you would have done is you would have sat down with the upper echelon of the religious crowd. It's almost as if if we were to fast forward it in our modern day terminology. You can imagine if we were to have some great camp meeting with thousands of Pentecostal folk from Church of God's all over the place that attend that meeting and yet Jesus Christ comes down into that meeting and you might have all the preachers sitting in the preacher uh, throne crowd got all their preacher seats and whatever and God don't even come down and sit with the preachers. Uh, God came down and God said I got a few sinners right here in the back. I got one over there who's about to lose this. Uh, everybody to lose her. I got one over there who's got a disease and don't know what to do. I got one over here who's got a child that's laying on the deathbed having to go to Arnold Palmer every time you turn around getting cancer treatment and whatnot. I've got somebody over here that feels like they got nothing to live for. You preachers got your act together. Thank God. Keep preaching to these that are out here. But I'm going to go out there and I'm going to sit right by. I'm going to deal with. I'm going to touch. I'm going to reach out to. Those that really need it, somebody needs mercy. Can somebody say thank God for his mercy this morning? But their argument is based on the fact that they don't think that anybody else deserves the mercy. They think the pendulum of mercy only swings in their direction. You ever met anybody like that? Well, the pendulum of mercy only swings my direction because you wear a dress all the time. Because you've never worn makeup. Because you've never put jewelry on because you cut your hair short or because your hair is a little too long. Let me tell you something. I believe in having a modest standard of living in our life. But I'm afraid that a lot of people have exercised their God-given right to voice their opinion. And they have exercised it to the point that they have cast out all understanding of what mercy was there to do in the first place. Hey Amen. I've been to churches where it felt like when you walked in, the only way that you could receive mercy is if you first line up with the church's top ten list of this and that and the other. But I'm glad you could walk in here in a one-piece bathing suit, baby doll, and God could save you heart. You can walk in here with purple hair and your prayer and your rainbow flag and God can save you and deliver you from that abominable homosexual lifestyle right there in that altar. I'll serve a God amen that can do much more than even old religious staunch crowds can imagine. Why? Because I serve a God that's so much bigger than our mentality. We think God's this big but God said heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool and if I want to forgive somebody you step back. Why I forgive them and if you can't forgive don't expect me to forgive you oh God don't expect his mercy if you can't give it say amen 
In verse number three through six, the Lord, he acknowledges the crowd and he replies to them. And I love the way he does it. He uses a a parable about a hundred sheep. Not about 99 sheep. He uses a parable about a hundred sheep. And the Bible said in this parable, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which was lost? I want to read this again to you. How many is going to help me while I preach slow for a minute? While you get this real good and ingrained in you. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety nine in the wilderness, go after that which is lost until he gets tired of looking? That is not what it says. Until he gets so sick and aggravated, burdened, with that sheep always running off. You get what I'm preaching this morning. You get what he said. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. That means I got 99 at the house who might still have it together. They're still corralled. But I got one that's so important to me. I don't think that God is so up in heaven looking at it like, well, I got so many that love me, so many that are saved, that I don't care about that one over there. Come on now. Hey, Amen. I use simple analogies sometimes, but I can tell you that when I buy a big old box full of drywall screws to put that wall angle up, there's been many a times I'd be putting it up and my son Devin would be on the ground as my helper and I'd drop a screw here and drop a screw there and a screw over here and he'd be picking them up trying to hand I said son don't worry about it I don't care about them screws come on now some of them they got a blunted dull head where I tried to use it wouldn't go in I don't care about that I got a whole pocket full of screws uh, you're, you're causing me to stop what I'm doing to just turn around and grab a few insignificant screws uh, but let me tell you somebody God don't look at it like that he don't look at it like well I'm just gonna wash you off I'm gonna write you off I got enough people over at Grace Street to love me. I got enough people on that platform that'll sing to me. I got enough people that'll get in that altar and pray for me or pray to me. Let me tell you somebody. God ain't wrote not one of you off. I said God ain't wrote not one of you off. He still loves you enough. You just gotta make up your mind whether you're ready to receive the mercy. Somebody say amen this morning. My God in heaven. But verse 4 shows the destruction of the unity and togetherness of the sheepfold. You see, he's not going to be satisfied until every effort has been exhausted to bring home every wayward sheep back into the fold. And that shows us this morning just how valuable that every single sheep is. I'm going to ask you a question, Stephen, and just be honest. Were there ever a time whenever you're out of church, not serving God, in any point of your life that you ever felt kind of somewhat insignificant. Like it really don't matter. They ain't going to miss me. They got all the people there. It ain't going to matter if I'm not there. I'm going to think about this. Think about every message. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm trying to preach a message here. But think about every message you could have preached. Think about every soul in life that could have been touched in the meanwhile. Were you insignificant? His mercy was significant when you felt insignificant. And I'm going to tell somebody this morning. You might feel like, Pastor Myers, i got no reason to live. My family's so messed up. My life's so messed up. Let me tell you something. You're looking at somebody that felt like their family was all messed up. Come on now. Toss like a football from here to there. Live with this family member a little while. Live with that family member a little while. My family's so messed up. I didn't know who loved me, who didn't love me, and I got to the place where I didn't believe hardly anything anybody told me. Anybody ever been in a situation like that? 
I hear my daddy say he loved my mama and watch him beat her face in the concrete outside. And if my mom and dad's watching this, I hold no, res- no disrespect towards them. This is just preaching the facts of life to make a point this morning. I watched that and I questioned whether my dad, when he said he loved my wife, my mom, how can you love my mom? And you beat her face into the ground. I'm thinking to myself. But you see, let me tell you something, folks. Whenever God saved my life in 1997, a lot of things of my life came into perspective. I didn't understand a lot of stuff. Come on now. I didn't think mama loved me when she pulled out that extension cord from the vacuum cleaner and nearly beat the daylights out of me and left welts all over my body. I thought dear God in heaven, how's that love? You know what I'm saying? I couldn't quite understand it. Whenever she was sitting inside the house watching Days of Our Lives and them soap operas uh, and it's a hundred and some degrees outside and she locked the door and all that locked the window and I, I was a deviant little boy. I walked over to the breaker box and I shut the power off. I said if you, I can't enjoy it, neither can you. Come on now. Amen. But that's the way I was. But my life was so twisted I didn't understand what real love was. But in 1997 I found out what real love was. Uh, Had a lot of people that let me down. Well guess what I found out as I got older the same way that people let me down I've also let other people down. Somebody you need to remember that. I said some of you will let folks down too. Come on now. You ain't telling you. A lot of times folks want to play the victim. Well, I've been so let down. Bless God. I've been so all poor, pitiful me. You let folks down too. You might as well own up to it. You've let people down too. Amen. But in 1997, I told you how many of you in the past, how that one day I pulled up into the side uh, yard of where my family, I lived most of my childhood. My mom and dad still live there. Amen. I went inside the house. I said, Dad, I said, I need to talk to you. He's my stepdad, not my real dad. We never played football together. We never did much of anything but argue. Amen. And every time I came home, if I did wrong, uh, first thing my mom said, he did this, he did that. Before anything was over he'd take me to the back room and beat the daylights out of me and that was my relationship with my dad he meant he went to work he paid the bills and it was that was that was dad Uh, but that day there was a lot of bitterness and a lot of anger and a lot of hatred built up inside of me there were times I wanted to kill him there were I'm being honest uh, there were times I thought about sneaking in the room whenever he was sleeping and just beating his brains in because I hated him for doing what he did to me at least I felt but I can tell you that when I slid up into that parking lot in that car and I got out that day I went inside and I said dad I need to talk to you hey man my dad looked up at me and he said all right boy what you need I said well come on outside well my dad he was he drove a little blue pickup truck worked for a place called Superior Asphalt had a little Chevy S10 parked on the side of the truck of the house how we went outside and brother Stephen when we walked out there I remember there was another something out on another car and I leaned up against one car and he leaned up against the hood of his truck and I looked at him and my lips were quivering uh, my whole insides were shaking I didn't know how in the world I was going to say what I had to say uh, but I just got saved not long ago and God had wrought a work in my life uh, and some had changed inside of me and whenever I opened up my mouth uh, I said dad I just want to tell you something uh, I said I got saved and I gave my life to God he just looked at me kind of suspicious he said well, that's good, son. That's good. I said, I just want to tell you. I said, I know that my childhood, hey amen, wasn't that great. I said, I know I've done a lot of bad stuff. I said, I just want to ask you to do me a favor. He's looking at me. I said, I just want to ask you, will you forgive me for everything that I've done wrong? You know the reason why? It's because even though I felt like my dad and mom and my family had done me wrong, I had to come to grips with the fact that there was a lot of stuff I'd done too. I wasn't the only, come on now, they weren't the only participant. Everybody had a hand in it. Say amen. I said, I want you to forgive me. I had already gone that day and I'd already made up my mind, Sister Farmer, whether my daddy forgave me or not. I was going to get a boatload of junk off this boy's shoulders uh, and I was going to shuck it off uh, and put it in the hands of the Lord. Uh, but I looked my daddy in the whites of his eyes. Uh, I had tears flowing down my face uh, and I said, Dad, uh, I said, I want you to forgive me. He said, all right, son, I forgive you. And I said, uh, I just want to tell you that I love 
love you. I said, I want to tell you that I love you. God's wrought a work in me, a change in me. He looked at me, and for the first time that I can ever recall in my childhood, I was raised in this man's home. I never heard him say, hey, man, I love you, son. Oh, I love you. Never heard him one time ever say, I love you. I always wondered, did he care for me? I always thought he hated me. But that day when I looked at him and I said, I love you, I saw tears in his eyes uh, as a hot tear ran down his face. uh, And he said, son, I love you too. He said, I just got to tell you. He said, I just want to tell you that I appreciate what you're doing. He said, because you are the father and you are the husband that I never could be. I couldn't get it together. I made a lot of mistakes. But I'll tell you now, when I call my mom and daddy's house, we like this now. You know why? I want you to say it with me. Mercy is the answer. Mercy is like fire. It's communicable. In other words, if something catches on fire, this paper catches on fire, I can take this paper over here to Brother Stephen and hold it near his shirt and set his shirt on fire. Do you know that mercy is communicable? Mercy is contagious. Amen. For you to be able to show mercy, you first got to receive mercy. I'm going to tell you, I feel the spirit of God here in this house. Somebody raise your hand and say, God, help us here in this house. But the Bible said that when he found it, he laid it on his shoulders rejoicing. He lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. Rejoicing. Man, I, where's my suit jacket at? I started thinking about throwing somebody over my shoulder, but I don't think that's probably a good idea. When he finally, I'm going to borrow this a minute, all right? When he finally got where that sheep was, he got digging around, I I don't know, maybe it was up underneath a bush somewhere or whatever. He got that sheep out. He didn't pull it out. But he picked it up. He threw it over his shoulder. Rejoice. Rejoicing. Didn't he do that when he saved you? Why don't we reciprocate the same thing that we got whenever he saved us? I feel the Holy Ghost in this house. But he threw it over his shoulder rejoicing. Oh, I got my sheep. But it's just one. You got 99 more in the house. What does it matter? Because every single one matters. Not one is more important than the other. But Brother Steve, he took the burden of traveling the distance back to the fold upon himself. He didn't look at it and go, come on, get on. Come on now. Get. Go. For the entire trip all the way back to the house, he bore the burden of the trip for the sheep. Footprints in the sand. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. He brings an end to that aimless wandering of this sheep going here, going there. 
And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which was lost. That's what he did. Sometimes what we do, you ain't, you ain't gonna believe this. I had to walk 14 miles. Yeah, I sure did. I wanted to, I wanted to kill him. I, it's the most ridiculous thing you ever seen in your life. I wanted to just beat the snot out of him when I found him. I got so many thorns in my hands when I was reaching up underneath that brush. You got to be joking me. I ain't doing this again. This ain't going to happen again. Uh-uh. Mm-mm. No, I won't tell you what I'm going to do. I'll tell you what he did. And when he cometh home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. His excitement over the fact that the sheep was home went public. Isn't it a shame that we're so public with all of our criticisms, but we're not very vocal in public with the good things like we should be? Come on, somebody. You see, this story is good news. I'm going to have to close here in a minute, but this story is good news. It's good news, Brother Jimmy, to the center. Good news because the entire parable is a close resemblance of the fall of man that took place in the Garden of Eden and put distance between God and man. Think of it. This story is in direct connection with the whole overlay of what took place in the Garden of Eden. Man strayed away and became lost, didn't he? And thousands of years later, John 3.16 said what? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Somebody, are you hearing and feeling what I'm saying? He did the same thing as this overlay of this story. And Sister Barbara, he said, until he found his sheep. He was going until he found his sheep. And you can argue, me and Brother Stephen was talking about somehow the Jews believe about they still haven't received their Messiah, but thousands of years have passed, and he finally, time caught up, to him in a baby's manger born of a virgin birth and before you know it he hung up on that cross and in between time and eternity he found his sheep my God in heaven just like the father sends his son to restore the broken fellowship that you and I have with God I'm going to tell you this morning even though the religious crowd can't understand the decision that he made to eat or converse with sinners and publicans, people of low degree, people that didn't have religious status. That's all right. People ain't got to understand the reason why you do what you do. Maybe it's just simply because you've received mercy. You've been on the receiving end of mercy so many times that when you look outside of your eyeballs, you think to yourself, how how can I not be merciful? Say amen. It's not just good news for the sinner, but it's good news to the backslider. You may have gone as far away from the fold as you can get, or you might be barely outside of his eyesight. No matter if you're way off or kind of far off, somewhere in between, if you're not where you need to be, you're not in that fold it shows just how far mercy will go to get a hold of you. Now, you may push off the church. 
you may shrug off the pastor. You may stop going to the altar. You may have been a frequent person in the choir. You may resign your position and quit going to the choir. There's a lot of things you can do to try to disconnect from where you were. And I found how sheep, they say they're not always that smart. And they may wander over here. And then they wander over here a little while. And they're just go. They're not paying attention to where they're at. They're just. And the next thing you know, they're way out somewhere. And I see people do this thing all the time, where that they start off. Well, I won't compromise, but just a little bit. I, I won't go back on God, but just a little bit. I won't let up, but just just a little bit. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep just enough slack in this rope where I can still live my life and do my thing. But all the while, mercy. It's still knocking at the front door of your soul. But it's not just to the backslider. It's also to the saints. show you mercy this day. Look over your shoulder. You may see all the many times that I have shown you mercy in the past. I never gave up on you. I have not given up on you now, says the Lord. <laughs> Stand all across the house, if you will. I'm asking my daughter to come to the piano, please, and play and sing something. Stand to your feet this morning all across the house. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed all across the house of the Lord. The Word of God is a perpetual.